Hello and welcome to this special episode of The Newsmakers coming to you from TRT World Forum here in Istanbul where newsmakers from around the world have gathered together to try and figure out some of the pressing challenges facing the international community. My guest today is a man who is one of the most popular, controversial and dynamic leaders in Malaysia. He has a redemption story. He spent more than a decade in prison under charges that human rights referred to as politically motivated. But now he's primed to be the next prime minister. And Anwar Ibrahim joins me now here on the Newsmakers. So it's a pleasure talking to you. Do you still absolutely believe that you are the prime minister in waiting? Well, that is the arrangement, uh, the agreement, and you know the system allows for um, change to take place when a, a member of parliament enjoys the support of the majority that I have. And uh, we are also stuck to an agreement duly signed by party leaders in January, five months before the elections. Prime so, Min inshallah. Right, inshallah. But inshallah can mean many things in many <laughs> yeah. places, right? It's adaptable. Yeah. Prime Minister Mahathir has signaled that he wants to stick around for another three years. Is that acceptable to you? No, he did not say that. And, and I did, um, in my weekly exchanges with him, he made quite clear that uh, he will honour the agreement. Hmm. Do you doubt that he won't in any way? No, I have no reason to question his um, commitment. Hmm. There are some machinations at the moment. Some pieces are moving, right? Malay parties from both sides of the aisle. Um, it's difficult to describe this, but I guess they're talking about an, a kind of ethnic unity. And some people see it as trying to find a way to ensure that you don't become prime minister because you don't want to put ethnic Malays first. You want to make things less sweet for them. Is that what's happening right now? Well, the machinations won't stop. This is politics. This is a democracy. And um, I think the issue of race is being used. As you know, even patriotism can be the last refuge for sex scoundrels. Mm. So now uh, you resurface the issue of race because they fear the uh, tough stance that I have against corruption and abuse of power. And I think my, my interest is therefore to proceed on that score. Uh, I'm a Malay, I'm a committed Muslim. I want the Muslims uh, and the Malays to succeed. But um, I'm also a leader for all Malaysians. Mm. And it is time that after six decades of independence, we uh, consider our citizens and treat them as equal. Why is it that that has been given oxygen right now? This idea that we need to put Malays first, Malay Muslims first, ahead of Chinese or Indians or whatever. And, and that has created a kind of political momentum. Why is it? Well, the, 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 the pioneers or the uh, planners um, of this sort of congress and uh, new alignment are those uh, complicit to the crimes of the past. They were completely oblivious or silent or muted when there were endemic, massive corruption. Uh, they were not concerned. They did not articulate the issues of the vast majority of the Malay poor or gross inequality in this country. Uh, so I think, to my mind, to assist the Malays to have a transparent program to assist the poor, respective of race. The vast majority remains the Malays. So what are you talking about, Malay supremacy, when you condemn them to poverty, you enrich the few, you condone corruption, and uh, you ignore even the ethical values and uh, uh, universal values of Islam? Hmm. I want to get a bit deeper into corruption, especially the corruption of the previous administration in, in a few moments. But I want to focus on the position of Prime Minister. It doesn't seem as easy as it was initially said, because uh, Mohammed Azmin Ali seems to want the throne as well. At least that's the feeling. Does he want that job? It's not a crime for anyone to aspire to become a Prime Minister, but he has to enjoy the support of the majority. And I think for now, um, until the meeting last week among the party leaders, there is no consideration of any other name. People can dream, can aspire, but that does not mean that you're going to shake or scuttle the process. 
the, uh, and furthermore, it has been duly agreed and signed. So you have to then to undo this process. Mm. Now, there is no attempt or initiative to undo this. Has he told you that he wants the job? Well, he has not said that. Mm. So where's the speculation coming from? The speculation comes from, from partly some of his quarters and uh, some you know, supporters. Uh, but it, it does not really, it should not uh, distract us from our major task mm. to uh, um, build up the economy. Mm. I think the, as far as the people and the Rakyat is concerned, it's bread and butter issues right. that we have to address. Do you fully trust the man who's currently the Prime Minister to hand over the keys to you when, as you mentioned, it was politically motivated, trumped up charges in the past? He's the man responsible for you being locked up for more than a decade. How can you fully trust him to keep to his word that you will take over from him? No, we, when we um, decided to work together, that must be based on trust. Uh, and, and to consider the interests of the nation um, above some of the personal tribulations that one had to endure. That is done. And I continue to engage. Uh, but the issue is not Mahade or Anwar. It's not my decision or Mahade's personal decision, ultimately. It's a decision of the majority of members of the House of Parliament. And that's what the system says. And as it stands, there is no change whatsoever. Let's talk about corruption. How much of a mess did Najib Razak leave behind? Well, the one MDB fiasco is termed as the worst financial uh, scandal involving any government in modern times. So you can imagine the extent, the volume and the depth of the scandal. Um, Goldman Sachs is also complicit. It is not, I mean, a, a government or leadership will not have the capacity n nor the sophistication to deal with it unless you have the backing of some of these known international financial institutions. Uh, but having said that, uh, it is huge, it's horrendous, it's, it's, has, it has adversely affected uh, the standing, the confidence, and the economy of the country. Hmm. And how long do you need to fix that then? Now we are at the, uh, in the process of fixing it. We have got some funds being returned. Uh, the cases pending in our court in the United States. And, um, but many governments are giving the cooperation, including the Department of Justice hmm. of the United States of America and the Swiss government and some other neighbouring countries. But I think uh, it will take some time, but I don't believe that people will be patient enough to wait for this to be resolved. We have to take um, proactive measures to deal and resolve our economic problems. Right. Okay, so May 2018, that's when everything changed. It's almost a year and a half, right? So people look at some of the promises of the new government. They look at the Sedition Law, Sedition Act as well colonial era law for many it was the government taking a gun to a knife fight or even a gun to a fist fight anytime there's some sort of criticism or something they use the sedition act uh, knock out the criticism are you committed to getting rid of that this is a commitment that i made and the party made and is clearly uh, manifested in the manifesto of the pakatan harapan prior to the elections uh, but we have a problem with the narrative. There are concerns by the Malays whether this would give uh, an open uh, gate for people to just abuse Malay position or language or the royalty. But is that true? Well, I don't believe it's true because there are enough laws against uh, libel or sedition. Uh, so you don't need to resort to these draconian measures mm. to curb the freedom of people to express themselves. Does it harm... Malaysian democracy when you still have a law like that on the books? Well, uh, overall, there is uh, a free media now. There is a uh, semblance of uh, in judicial independence, uh, professionalism in terms of enforcement agencies. So taking, taking overall, 
this has been in place. But I think there are, of course, uh, limitations and, and until we are able to uh, implement uh, some of these reforms that we promised prior to the elections, it is still uh, deemed to be an incomplete reform agenda. Tell me how you viewed the political situation in Malaysia while you were in prison. Well, I have no access to the media, I have no access to the radio, television. So in solitary confinement, essentially you are uh, sane, you keep your sanity because you are not bothered by all these negative uh, news, uh, particularly <laughs> at your expense. Um, but of course, I have access to the family from time to time, to my lawyers, and the prison guards were marvellous. They were really? so supportive. So there were a lot of whisperings and smuggling of letters and notes and uh, reports. But did you feel like the country had lost its way while you were in prison? I was convinced that uh, when I raised the issue of the 1MDB scandal in 2010-11, I was the first to bring it up in Parliament, I know that this is going to be a major uh, problem for me because the powers that be would not tolerate this. Uh, and then I could sense the slide, economy, uh, general public confidence, the institutions of uh, governance and of course corruption. And that is why um, I think when, when Tun Mahathir came to see me in court and sought uh, this sort of a reconciliation or a re reapproachment and to work together to uh, topple the existing corrupt regime, I, th after some reflection and uh, s swallowing or keeping my, my, my anger or frustration, I thought that is the best for the nation. Did you have to work very hard to get rid of the desire for vengeance, for justice? Yeah, but you know, uh, time is uh, by itself um, a reprieve. And, and um, with my age, you, I realized that there were so many things to be done than to be stuck with the old anger. It was not very difficult. A lot of friends uh, were a bit... Um, suspicious mm. uh, that I was just making a politically correct statement to say, well, let bygones be bygones. But I said, no, I mean, uh, I, it was not too difficult. It's more than pragmatism then? It's not just pragmatism because I think um, I, it's also an issue of uh, akhlaq or ethics or morality mm. because um, uh, if, if your heart is full of vengeance and anger, you can't talk about justice and compassion. Uh, but it does not mean that I will condone, you know, these uh, brutalities and uh, uh, injustice uh, perpetrated against me now. I mean, I said, look, I went through hell. Um, Aziza, my wife and my family and my colleagues, and I don't think it should recur. Not to Anwar, not to anyone in the country. Mm. You're almost a statesman now. What are you preparing for? How are you preparing for that? I take a lot of time to listen uh, on digital technology, on issue of governance, on issue of uh, economic policies. I listen to you know, various interna ex international experts and local experts. But I'm always of the view that finally you have to uh, continue to connect with your people. So I'm back to the mosque and the village and um, interacting with the Muslims and the Hindus and the Christians and the Buddhists in Malaysia and also travel quite a bit to meet friends and uh, to speak. Mm. What should Malaysia be doing in terms of its foreign policy right now? Where should it place itself in the world? Well, I think um, we do not have too much of a difference throughout uh, the regime, both under the free administration or with Mahathir now on issues of uh, Palestine, on issues of Rohingyas, mm. on issue, most of it uh, we seem to be quite independent uh, for democracy, for justice, against um, atrocities perpetrated by any uh, community, Muslims or non-Muslims, or religious minorities. I think we should stick, uh, uh, be, be, remain consistent with that position. Mm. If you'll allow me an observation being in this job, right? Are you aware of the NBA scandal right now where 
you have these you have the NBA where, where players go out and they, they talk very openly, coaches as well, about police brutality and so on in the United States. But when they speak about China or Hong Kong, it's all shut down. And a lot of them say, well, you know, I don't want to get into politics and mm. so on. My observation, speaking to leaders within the Muslim world, I've spoken to Imran Khan, I've spoken to Mahathir as well a couple of months ago. It seems as if with leaders of Muslim-majority countries, it's easy to talk big about Kashmir, about Palestine, about the Rohingya. But when I ask them about, for example, the Uyghurs in China, credible evidence which suggests that the Chinese are incarcerating more than a million Uyghur Muslims in what could be concentration camps, which bear all the markings of concentration camps, everyone's a little careful about that because it affects the bottom line because China's so powerful. Are the Muslim leaders hypocrites when it comes to this? It's easy to talk big about Palestine, but China, we don't want to say anything, even though they're persecuting Muslims. Well, not hypocritical, but circumspectful because of the concerns that such policy statements may affect the common person. Um, I, I, I think we should still reserve the right to express our views, even albeit politely, uh, there are issues, uh, there are contentious issues. I mean, we mentioned Kashmir. Um, it, whether you suggest, you state or not, it is a problem. So I think uh, we need to uh, at least state our position and to appeal for dialogue, for understanding. The same on, on the Geshe of Yigur. I did in the uh, interview with the Washington Post raise the issue. And of course, the Communist Party leaders raised it with me. And I said, of course, in my position, being in prison, talking about justice, it is very difficult for me to just dismiss. So I would certainly appeal to them to, to, to uh, try and respond to some of the concerns expressed. So it, would that be one of the things you take very seriously as Prime Minister, where you tell the Chinese this is not on, this is unacceptable? Probably I would uh, use a more nuanced uh, statement, but, but I think uh, they would understand me by now that I'm a Democrat, I, I am strong on issues of human rights, I, I don't go and declare war against countries, but I would like to appeal to all these countries to respect. I have a religious minorities in Malaysia. When a Hindu temple, for example, was desecrated in the past or demolished by the previous regime, I stood up and spoke for them. When uh, a, a church in, um, near Kuala Lumpur was, uh, I mean, a, a Molotov cocktail was thrown against them. I was there, one of the first visitors to the church. So I think uh, to be consistent and morally coherent, uh, I would uh, suggest the same thing, um, treatment by the Hindus upon the Muslims in India or the Chinese for the ego. So it's not something inconsistent or hypocritical. How do you feel about the definition that you're a political Islamist or that you're a proponent of political Islam? I'm not uh, too worried about this phobia, this Islamophobia. The moment you, you, they expect you to be a Muslim, uh, so liberal that you can't mention religion at all. Uh, you can be a Christian Democrat, you can't be a Muslim Democrat. Mm. Uh, I think this hypocrisy is, to me, useless. That's why I, in the TRT World Forum, I uh, made reference to Edward Said's uh, brilliant short article in The Nation, Clash of Ignorance. It's not ignorance of not knowing. It's also the ignorance of the sense of justice and compassion. Uh, so, so to my mind, being a Muslim, understanding Islam, is a credit to Malaysians because I am stronger in my belief for democracy, for justice, for compassion. Not only to the Muslims, but also to the non-Muslims. And, and, and contrary to their view that Islam is only promoting uh, sectarianism or terrorism. I mean, it's completely absurd. Hmm. But, but um, so I, do, I'm, I make no apologies right. on this. Okay, so when, when people look at some of the pressing issues in the world, especially when it comes to the persecution of Muslim communities, they see whether it's Prime Minister Mahathir or Prime Minister Imran Khan, President Erdogan and others, when they see them speak out, 
there's a cynical argument to say that these guys are just doing it for domestic political purposes in order to win or retain the conservative vote. Is there an element of truth in that? There may be but political leaders are motivated by different motives, but you have to understand the person, whether it is uh, genuine, whether it's coherent message, whether it is um, expression of a consistent position on the issues or not. Um, and, and I think um, I was not to cast aspersions. If what is said is right and uh, just, mm -hmm. we need to support. You know, um, um, otherwise we can only dig in. Why is it when it comes to Erdogan, uh, what is said is, is being suspect. Mm. When it comes to uh, Macron or Trump or Boris Johnson, is, uh, you know, some excuses are given. I mean, this hypocrisy is appalling. Mm. I mean, um, you can talk about free media in the West, but you can, when the, the moment you talk about Islam, then you are, you are dead. You know, and, and, and I experienced that. I mean, I was teaching at Georgetown University, uh, a lot of interviews. The popular question is they think, well, this is quite uh, uh, a liberal democrat, we like him, but we can't understand why he tends to work with the Muslims, why he, is, con he continues to be friendly with some of the Islamists or some of the Islamic scholars like Qaradawi or whatever. I said, I meet all the neocons. Paul Wolfowitz. Yes, a great you friend. You described him as your friend. Yes, right? yes, he's a personal. When Muslims say, "But this man was part of that group that was responsible for hundreds of thousands of Iraqi deaths," how can you sit down with the guy? Your response is, "I disagree with him strongly. I have a very, very tough position on him vis-à-vis -vis the Iraq War, but on some other issues, democracy, on justice, even my personal predicament, he was." I mean, genuine. So we take a strong position against him. Similarly, with many of the countries, you take a position against countries in their action, but still you continue to dialogue. Yours is not to, uh, to I mean, to, to condemn a person, but to engage. And, and, and I'm, I'm, um, um, let me make it clear that uh, uh, I've known uh, Paul for a long time and I've strongly disagreed with him. I mean, virtually at war in terms of uh, personal relations on the issues of, of the Iraq war. But his strength is um, on the other issues. He's is certainly much fairer, much just. And I don't think I can, I can just condemn a person mm -hmm. uh, just because of my disagreement, strong disagreement over one issue. If he gets a second term, I guess you'll have time. But... If it's only going to be one term, do you hope to be in the seat quickly enough to be able to work with Donald Trump or engage with Donald Trump? Well, I'm not particularly keen um, of, of engaging with him, but uh, we are, of course, very um, uh, strong in that our commitment to uh, establish bilateral, strong bilateral relations with the United States in terms of trade and mainly and investments. Um, other than that, uh, I'm a s small leader from a small country. We don't deal with the big giants. Don't short sell yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure talking to you, Anwar oh, Ibrahim. You. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you very much. much. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of the Newsmakers from TRT World Forum here in Istanbul. Until next time, bye-bye.